Thank you. The final item of business is a member's business debate on motion 15746 in the name of Miles Briggs on Parkinson's in Scotland. This debate will be concluded without any questions being put. Could I ask those members who wish to speak in the debate to press the request to speak buttons now? And I call on Miles Briggs to open the debate. Mr Briggs. Thank you, Deputy uh, Presiding Officer. I'd like to start by thanking colleagues from across the chamber um, for supporting my motion, which has allowed me to bring forward the debate uh, this evening. And I want to begin by paying tribute to the excellent work of Parkinson's UK in Scotland and commend their efforts for all those who work and volunteer and fundraise for the charity, including so many in my own Lothian region. All of us will have a family member, friend or colleague who will know, or will know someone in our community who has Parkinson's, a condition that can be so utterly devastating for so many individuals and their loved ones. Many of us will also remember with great fondness our former colleague Margaret MacDonald and for those of us who were lucky enough to know her saw at first hand how she did not allow her Parkinson's to define her. Margaret's still very much missed, I know, um, by her very close friends such as yourself, Deputy Presiding Officer. Parkinson's is the second most common degenerative disease after Alzheimer's and around 30 people in Scotland are currently diagnosed every week. While most associated with old age, one in seven people with Parkinson's is under 65. Another reason why I campaign for and welcome the extension for free personal care for the under 65s in Scotland. More and more of us can expect to have direct or close experience of Parkinson's since the number of people with it is, ex is expected to increase by 40% within the next two decades. All of us will want to ensure that the best possible health and support services are available for people with Parkinson's and those who help to care for and look after them. Anyone reading Parkinson's UK People Parkinson's Scotland report, which is detailed and comprehensive, will share my concerns that Scotland is not currently providing the level and quality of services and support every person with Parkinson's deserves, 20% of whom have extremely high levels of care need. Parkinson's UK has talked about a Scotland-wide under-provision of services for people living with Parkinson's. It's therefore alarming that around one in every 10 consultant posts in neurology and medicine for older people is currently unfilled with particular pressures in some areas, meaning the number of um, health board vacancies are even worse. In terms of waiting times for a new outpatient appointment ahead of diagnosis, the vast majority of NHS boards are regularly unable to meet the 12-week 12 uh, 12 target. In July last year, it took over 42 weeks for 95% of people to see a neurologist in NHS Grampian and almost 33 weeks um, in NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde. Most people living with Parkinson's will say that the most important person helping them to live with their condition is their Parkinson's nurse. Yet when Scotland should have at least 40 full-time Parkinson's nurses, we have under 30. Only one health board, Western Isles, has adequate specialist Parkinson's nurse provision. And in four mainland health boards, including my own here in NHS Lothian, there's about half the number of nurses uh, there should be. This means local Parkinson's nurses are often dealing with many more patients than the recommended maximum caseload. Like I said, in my own region um, and in my own NHS board, for example, three nurses today are responsible for helping almost 1,800 patients when Parkinson's UK recommends a maximum caseload of 300 uh, for each full-time nurse in an urban area. In Orkney and Shetland, there are currently no Parkinson's nurses at all. This is letting down both people with Parkinson's and our NHS staff and often adding to the pressures of local GP surgeries as well. Ensuring that we have an adequ adequate number of nurse, uh, nurses and neurologists and Parkinson's nurses is in all parts of Scotland must be a priority for the government. I'm continuing to call for a review of all specialist nurse provision in Scotland so that we can ensure we can plan for the future need and put in place the number of specialist nurses we need today. And I hope SNP ministers um, will look at that call again. Elsewhere, the report makes key recommendations across a range of areas, including good practice in multidisciplinary teams, health teams, uh, mental health teams, self-management, enabling technology innovation, and ant anticipatory care planning. I want to talk briefly also um, about access to advanced treatments for Parkinson's. Sadly for few people, the standard Parkinson's uh, medication does not work effectively and they can have very severe symptoms including painful cramps and potentially being unable to unable to move or having uncontrollable movement 
These patients need access to advanced treatments, which can include deep brain stimulation surgery or advanced medications delivered by injection or pumps. People in this position are concerned that the new national um, Deep Brain Stimulation Centre in Glasgow has incredibly long waiting times, over a year currently for assessment and surgery. So it's clear that more theatre staff capacity is needed to further develop this vital treatment. In addition, not all NHS boards are providing access to apomorphine injections or pumps, and there's huge variations around prescribing in this area as well. We also need to see more specialist support being provided that's required um, in initiating and monitoring people on um, apomorphine. And, al and although uh, duodopa, a treatment that delivers an infusion of medication in the inte intestine, has been approved by the Scottish Med Medicines Consortium, only three people to date have been able to undertake this treatment in Scotland uh, since 2016. We need to understand better why more patients who have a very low quality of life are not being actually offered this treatment. This treatment can and does have a transformation effect, a transforma transformative, trans I can't even say the word here, transformative, transformative effect on patients' <laughs> lives. Um, as, as my own constituent here in Edinburgh uh, told me, David Taylor, um, a former Falklands veteran, um, has testified. And I'd be interested to hear um, in the Minister's comments as he's uh, closing this debate what plans the Scottish Government has um, to advance these Parkinson's uh, treatments. Um, to conclude, Deputy Presiding Officer, I again uh, would like to commend Parkinson's UK and the 13 clear positive recommendations it has produced in what is a very useful and important uh, report. People living with Parkinson's across Scotland are looking to ministers and this parliament to set out how they can take forward improvements so that everyone diagnosed with Parkinson's in Scotland can be confident that they will have access to the very best possible health care and support. Thank you. Thank you very much. I call Kenneth Gibson to follow by Brian Whittle. Mr Gibson. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and I congratulate Miles Briggs on securing this debate, providing an opportunity to discuss this valuable and comprehensive report into Parkinson's in Scotland just a few weeks on from World Parkinson's Day on 11th of April. Parkinson's is the second most common neurodegenerative condition after Alzheimer's, and its complex and progressive nature can have profound effects with symptoms and impacts affecting every individual differently. Parkinson's UK has, for many years, given voice to sufferers, supporting them in all aspects of life, from the weekly meetings of its Ayrshire branch, an Isle of Arran group in my own constituency, their monthly massage sessions, Zumba and Pilates classes, to their working age Parkinson's group. Many people with Parkinson's in Cunningham North benefited directly from their work over the past 50 years. Parkinson's UK, UK's collective experience of working directly with people in Scotland means they are well placed to feedback to policymakers about how we can better support those affected. The report, People, Parkinson's, Scotland, What Do We Know About Services and Support for People with Parkinson's in Scotland, was published in February, backed by leading neurologists. A key report recommendation highlighted in Miles Briggs motion is to ensure everyone with Parkinson's has regular and easy contact with a specialist Parkinson's nurse at every stage of their condition, wherever they live in Scotland. People with Parkinson's frequently say their nurse specialist is the person who makes the single biggest difference in managing life with the disease. The value of their work cannot be underestimated. The report highlights that across Scotland there should be at least 40 Parkinson's nurses. Instead, we have less than 30. Indeed, Ayrshire has the equivalent of two nurses, whereas it should have 3.3 to adequately serve the estimated 1,000 people living with Parkinson's in Ayrshire. I've engaged with NHS Ayrshire Nan and the Scottish Government over several months and I'm, pl I'm pleased that the Health Board is redesigning their Parkinson's service into multidisciplinary teams. These will provide assessment and support to people living with Parkinson's, freeing up specialist nurses to see newly diagnosed patients at an advanced stage and those with particularly complex needs. However, I still support calls to increase specialist nurse provision. I was therefore pleased when Minister for Public Health Joe Fitzpatrick confirmed the Scottish Government is working with partners and stakeholders to develop nursing roles to meet Scotland's future needs under the Transforming Roles programme. As part of this, a working group will consider the clinical nurse specialist role to ensure it nas is nationally consistent, sustainable and progressive. I hope this working group will ultimately help to bolster the number of specialist nurses in Ayrshire and across Scotland. In Ayrshire, there is currently one consultant geriatrician with an interest in Parkinson's and members of the Ayrshire Working Age Parkinson's Group don't get consultant appointments as often as they feel are necessary. 
NHS Air Sharnan has tried to recruit a second consultant numerous times with no success, giving rise to concerns about how high quality support for Parkinson's disease sufferers in Ayrshire can be sustained without increased specialist staffing, especially given that patient numbers are expected to increase by 40% in 20 years. Ayrshire's recruitment difficulties are not unique, with one in every 10 consultant posts in neurology and medicine for older people in Scotland currently unfilled. One detrimental effect is that waiting times for first appointments are growing, leaving people with suspected Parkinson's facing longer periods without a diagnosis to explain worrying symptoms or a treatment plan. Scotland can and must do better for the thousands of people with Parkinson's by making necessary preparations now to ensure health boards can recruit the neurological consultants they need. The Scottish Government has already committed to supporting a review of consultant neurologists and neurophysiologists' roles to make posts more attractive. This should bring more people into neurology and help retain them. Presiding officer, I'm pleased the Scottish Government is now considering responses to its consultation on the draft National Action Plan on Neurological Conditions and look forward to publication later this year. And I'm confident it will respond positively to concerns and recommendations of Parkinson's UK and others who provide expertise and experience through the consultation process. I conclude by echoing Miles Briggs' sentiments towards a hard-working staff and dedicated team of volunteers who make Parkinson UK's life-changing work a reality. The guidance and support they provide is sitting to none and has immeasurably improved the lives of people with this complex and often devastating condition. Thank you very much. I call Brian Whittle to be followed by Jackie Bailey. Mr Whittle. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. And can I add my congratulations to my colleague, Miles Briggs, for securing time in this chamber for this debate. As we've heard, Parkinson's disease is a degenerative neurological condition that predominantly, although not exclusively, manifests itself in the older generation. Given that, as, as we are all aware, our population is growing older, it is reasonable to assume then that, that the instances of conditions like Parkinson's will also grow. If we look at the progress for in treatments of conditions, for example, like cancer over the last couple of decades, we can see there's a remarkable uh, capability of science uh, in finding solutions. Yet when we compare treatments and medications over the same period for neurological conditions, we see a very different picture. It's obvious that there has not been the same priority uh, with drug development and treatment. Now, most members uh, will know my personal interest in the neurological conditions sits with motor neuron disease, uh, first brought to my attention by Gordon Aitman, and then shortly followed by Doddy Weir. Two remarkable men uh, raising awareness, uh, fighting for better treatments for those who will follow, all the while battling against this cruel and degener degenerative condition. And I can tell you, it's hard to hear uh, Doddy say, uh, and I quote, it will come too late for me, but I want to make sure others have a better chance than me. When you stop to think what he's actually saying, uh, that this disease will take him. And in knowing that, he is prepared to use his time so effectively to campaign for those who will follow him. He's already confounded medical wisdom by not just being here, but still on his feet, still speaking with such a passion and with such humour, or, 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 or so he seems to think. Until then, I was pretty unaware of these conditions. Remarkable as Gordon and Dory are, it should not be left to them and others like them to bring these conditions into the public consciousness. Like Parkinson's, MND makes the sufferers unsteady and can affect their speech. Now, I remember hearing Gordon Makeman speaking about how so many people just assume that he drank too much alcohol, an assumption born out of ignorance. So we need to be more aware and in doing so recognize the need to advance medical science in the understanding and treatment of neurological conditions. Organizations like Parkinson's UK, MND Scotland, and the My Name is Doddy Foundation have a huge role to play in this fight, and we thank them for the continued work that they do. Surely, though, it is time for governments, and I say governments, to step up to the plate and take a swing along with these organisations. If we are to rid ourselves, or at the very least help to contain these hugely debilitating conditions in short shift, it will take a collective effort from all of us. Because if this challenge is not accepted, as I said right at the start in my speech, with the ageing demographic we have in this country, the issues can only grow. So, in conclusion, Deputy Presiding Officer, I would like to ask the Minister, if in, in his summing up, there will be a commitment from the Scottish Government to work with these third sector organisations that currently lead the charge, and for, what, uh, uh, for the Scottish Government to play a significant role, and then detail what that commitment will look like. 
Deputy Presiding Officer. Thank you very much. I call Jackie Bailey, who will be followed by Liam MacArthur. Ms Bailey, please. Presiding Officer, I too would like to thank Miles Briggs for bringing this important debate to the Chamber, and I would also like to welcome the staff from Parkinson's UK and those living with Parkinson's and their friends and family who are either here this evening or listening to the debate on TV. Um, it is down to the constant support of Parkinson's UK and the dedicated activism of volunteers that means that each and every day we are closer to finding a cure for this debilitating disease. As Miles' motion rightly points out, there are over 12,000 people in Scotland right now who are living with Parkinson's. That's around one in every 375 adults. Findings from Parkinson's UK show that around 30 people each week are diagnosed with the disease. That means the lives of not just 30 people, but 30 families, friends and communities are changed forever, every single week. And each diagnosis affects each patient and their support network differently. Parkinson's UK, as well as hundreds of local Parkinson's support groups, provide invaluable support for sufferers. But with diagnosis predicted to increase by around 40% in the next 20 years, the Scottish Government and our health boards really need to step up to the plate. There are currently a number of Scottish health boards with half the number of Parkinson's specialist nurses than are actually needed. And it is deeply concerning that around 10% of neuro neurologists and older people's consultant posts in Scotland are currently vacant. In Greater Glasgow and Clyde, which covers my constituency, there are the equivalent of seven full-time Parkinson's nurses for over 2,000 Parkinson's patients that the health board covers. Now, these nurses are spectacular. They do a tremendous job, but they're really not enough of them. And I fully support the findings of the Parkinson's UK report and echo their calls for the Scottish Government, not just to meet with the organisation, but to discuss the implementation of the 13 recommendations. Now, I recognise there is great complexity with this disease. There are over 40 known symptoms, but that is not an excuse for inaction. Rather, it underlines why we need to take action now. It is down to each and every one of us in this chamber to provide the support to do so. But I would like to spend the rest of my time, as others have done, talking about the fantastic work carried out by the Helensborough Parkinson's Support Group. There are currently over 150 people in my constituency living with the disease, and the group provides a constant source of help and support to them. During Parkinson's Awareness Week, they took to the streets um, and collected an incredible £1,100 for research. Now, the group undertake exactly what both those living with Parkinson's disease and their families need to make day-to-day -day life more manageable. They run weekly Tai Chi lessons. I'm very tempted to join in, but they do that because they understand that movement and balance exercises help with many of the most common Parkinson's side effects. Tai Chi is also beneficial to mental health and well-being, which is understandably another aspect of an individual's health that can be affected by a Parkinson's diagnosis. The group also runs a number of trips out and social events, which allows for people to get together, socialise and share their experiences. I understand that strong drink might indeed be taken, presiding officer. But when I spoke to the group to ask them if there was anything in particular they wanted me to raise in this debate, their message was clear. They said, we need more research projects in Scotland. We need shorter waiting times for neurology appointments, and we need more Parkinson's nurses and multidisciplinary teams for Parkinson's care. This is not me as a politician making a political point. This is a group of people united by a goal to find a cure for Parkinson's and to make their lives, living with it, more bearable. I urge the Health Minister and the Scottish Government to listen, to listen to those who understand the impact of a Parkinson's diagnosis the most, and the time to act is now. Thank you. I uh, call Liam MacArthur to follow by Colin Smith. Mr Smith will be the last speaker in the open debate. Mr MacArthur, please. Yeah, thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer. Can I also warmly congratulate Miles Briggs on his uh, motion and securing uh, the debate. Can I too thank uh, Parkinson's UK and Scotland for uh, an excellent briefing, but also for the, the work they do uh, year round in raising awareness about uh, Parkinson's and highlighting the steps that need to be taken to provide the sort of services we are going to need uh, now and into the future. And I would certainly echo uh, Jackie Bailey's encouragement on the Minister to meet with Parkinson's UK to discuss the report, but importantly, the implementation of its key recommendations. 
I took part in a debate, a similar debate, um, last week on uh, MS Awareness Week, and there are obvious similarities uh, between these two neurological uh, conditions. Both are, are complex, uh, both are very specific uh, to each individual, but can be devastating uh, across the board in terms of their effects. There are similar numbers uh, impacted by uh, both conditions, but the projections of a 20% increase over the next decade and a 40% increase over the next 20 years in Parkinson's is a truly alarming uh, prospect. It underscores the importance of taking steps now to ensure uh, that we have the services in place to meet that growing demand. Specialist services, absolutely. We cannot simply rely on a generic model, uh, uh, important though that support will be. The workforce planning will be absolutely essential, as we're already seeing, as others have observed, uh, lengthy waits for neurological uh, appointments across the country uh, and a lack of uh, full-time uh, Parkinson's nurses to meet the current uh, demand. I was struck from the briefing also by the, um, the scale of the mental health dimension uh, to this debate. The, the, the figures are staggering. 50% of those with Parkinson's experience anxiety, 40% suffer depression, uh, and a third uh, also have dementia. Of course, this can't be a one-size-fits-all approach Scotland-wide. Uh, we need to have flexible models of care. I think Parkinson's UK and Scotland are absolutely right when they say that services need to be matched to the needs of people locally and the local dimension. But while the way the service is delivered may differ across the country, uh, there can be no question that the quality and the accessibility of that service needs to remain absolutely uh, consistent. At present, Orkney has no resident uh, consultant. We're reliant on NHS Grampian, which is already under serious uh, pressure to meet the demand of those in the Grampian region. There's perhaps no great surprise there, but uh, there is also no specialist nurse uh, in Orkney, unlike uh, the specialist nurse for MS. We're reliant on a nurse based in Aberdeen who does what she can and provides excellent support, but ongoing support at such a distance presents uh, challenges. By way of example, I was made aware recently of an elderly con uh, constituent who became extremely unwell because of his Parkinson's medication. His GP was unable to sort out the problem given its specialist nature and his situation got progressively worse over a number of weeks. Not until the Parkinson's nurse was able to make the trip up from Aberdeen could a proper assessment be made, a change in treatment recommended and a reduction in the severity of my constituent's symptoms be achieved. Uh, Deputy Presiding Officer, that is simply not good enough. I'm grateful, therefore, to Parkinson's UK for the efforts they have been uh, engaged in uh, through the local Parkinson's community in Orkney, where a recent meeting in Kirkwall was extremely well attended, where there was a real appetite uh, for establishing drop-in events, uh, as well as tailored exercise classes for those with Parkinson's matching what I think we've heard exists in other parts of the country. There's a strong demand to for a locally based Parkinson's nurse to work in collaborations with other health professionals and AHPs. This was the subject of discussions, I understand, last week between Parkinson's UK and the medical and nursing directors uh, at NHS or or Orkney. I'm told that those uh, discussions were positive uh, and a shared business plan is being developed with a view to working out how to proceed thereafter. I look forward to supporting those efforts and in the meantime, thank Miles Briggs again for bringing this debate and thank Parkinson's UK and Scotland for the support that they continue to provide by those who are affected by Parkinson's. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr MacArthur. I call Colin Smith. Can I refer members to my register of interest? At the time I was elected to Parliament in May 2016, I had the privilege of being employed by Parkinson's UK, a post that I obviously relinquished following the election. Can I also add my thanks to, to Miles Briggs for tabling his motion, providing members with the, the opportunity to highlight the health and, and care challenges faced by the more than 12,000 of our constituents who battle Parkinson's in Scotland every day. And as we heard, that number is set to rise by a fifth within the next decade and by 40% within two decades. Many of the growing number of our constituents living with Parkinson's will have some or all of its debilitating symptoms, maybe a tremor, maybe muscle stiffness or slow movement. But many may not, or they may have some or all of those symptoms to varying degrees or even at different times. Because, presiding officer, how Parkinson's affects someone differs from person to person, often from day to day, even from hour to hour. 
That's why the care provided to someone with Parkinson's needs to be personal, it needs to be specialist, it needs to be tailored to the individual. But we know from far too many of our constituents that despite the, the often heroic efforts of our health and social care workers, the care received by many living with Parkinson's doesn't always meet their individual needs. The financial cuts facing our health and social care partnerships, the shortage of doctors and specialist nurses, the rising waiting times are all laid bare by Parkinson's UK and their report, People Parkinson's Scotland. And we can see examples of this in our own constituencies. For a number of years, a recruitment crisis in NHS Ayrshire and Arran has left the region with just one specialist consultant geriatrician with an interest in Parkinson's instead of three working with just two Parkinson's nurses. As a result, some patients with Parkinson's have reported waiting more than a year for an appointment with their consultant, depriving them of the vital specialist care they need. There's good work taking place in NHS Ayrshire and Arran to try to mitigate these problems and improve services for people with Parkinson's. In particular, the development of multidisciplinary teams is an important step towards delivering more integrated person-centred care. But even the most effective service redesign is not a substitute for adequate resources. Parkinson's is a complex condition. It requires specialist care. The expertise of consultants and Parkinson's nurses is essential, but too often it's just not available as quickly or as easily as it needs to be. In large parts of the south of Scotland region, there are also serious challenges relating to rurality and isolation. Around 12% of people with Parkinson's live in remote or very remote communities, which can create an additional barrier to accessing the specialist care needed. I know in Dumfries and Galloway the fantastic work the small team of two Parkinson nurses do to ensure as best they can that care is available across the region to those living in rural and remote areas, despite the challenges that poses. But support, of course, isn't just provided by our health and social care service. As I mentioned earlier, I had the privilege of working for Parkinson's UK, and I doubt I'll ever come across a more caring, compassionate, professional group than the small team at Parkinson's UK in Scotland. They really do punch above their weight, supporting people with Parkinson's, often in truly innovative ways, I have to say, such as the recent campaign to raise awareness of Parkinson's, where buildings were lit up blue, including the artist town of Kirkubri, where Parkinson's UK fundraiser Jan Matheson and the local community lit up the whole town with examples of Billy Conley's artwork, giving it a new meaning to the big yin turning the air blue. There's also a small army of volunteers who support the work of the charity. And I can tell members when you work with those volunteers, often living with Parkinson's themselves or caring for a loved one who is, and you realize they've given up their time to help others through, for example, running a local support group, I can tell you that is a truly humbling experience. So I'm delighted to see that the number of support groups continues to grow, including the launch next month of a young person, Parkinson's Cafe in Dumfries, to complement the excellent support group already in the town. So, President Officer, in concluding, I want to say a heartfelt thank you to Parkinson's UK and Scotland and the hundreds of mm -hmm. volunteers for your dedication and support in my constituents and all those across Scotland who live with Parkinson's. I urge the government to show that same commitment and to implement the recommendations of people Parkinson's Scotland and help ensure, in the wise words of Parkinson's UK themselves, that we can bring forward the day when no one fears living with Parkinson's. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I call Joe Fitzpatrick to close to the Government Minister, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'm pleased to be able to respond on behalf of the Government and add my congratulations to Miles Briggs on securing this debate. Um, the, government, the Scottish Government wants people with Parkinson's to be active citizens, to participate in and contribute to our society and to maintain their dignity and human rights. So I therefore join with other members in paying tribute um, to the support that Parkinson's UK Scotland and others offer to help people with Parkinson's to live as well as possible for as long as possible and thank members from across the chamber for their considered contributions um, and um, I want to can maybe talk about a couple which I haven't I'm not covering later in my speech. Lynn MacArthur's comments um, in, in, in relation to um, matters in his constituency. Um, I, I had the privilege of um, attending Orkney for Orkney's annual um, NHS review, and I, and I had the privilege of, of meeting with one of the, the patients who used the specialist MS nurse, and it, it was really interesting to just to hear just how important that is. So I, I, I totally understand the, um, the desire for that to be available to people with Parkinson's in, in, in the Northern Isles to, um, um, but um, as, as, as is often the case, um, Mr. MacArthur um, 
gave answers to my, many of the points in terms of the work that's ongoing, and there is fantastic work ongoing in terms of looking at how these issues can be addressed in, in the future in, in that area. So th th there's um, definitely um, some particularly good uh, teamwork going on up there to try and make sure that people with Parkinson's and, and other neurological conditions get the best possible support in, in Orkney. Jackie Bailey, I was particularly interested to hear the, 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 the examples from her constituency. Um, I won't rehearse them because she rehearsed them perfectly, but it does give me the opportunity to talk about another example of that kind of more holistic and sometimes like, not directly clinical support that, that, that people really need. And, and, and I'm actually going to um, read out a, a tweet from Sports Scotland who, who are I think actually talking about last Thursday's debate, and, and it's, a, it's a hangover, but it's, it just really shows how um, sport, physical activity, and, and health can all come together. So um, Sports Scotland were tweeting about um, a boxing club in, club in Glasgow, rock steady, where they are fighting back against Parkinson's with a revolutionary exercise program, which they say is having um, dramatic results. And I think that's really important because it's not just all about clinical, it's, it's, it's a wider um, support that we require. And um, I think going back to the, the points that members have made about um, Parkinson's UK Scotland and, and the, how they really pull that together from so many organisations and for so many pe uh, people. As we've heard uh, through the debate, Jackie Bailey and others, um, Parkinson's is a, a, a complex and progressive condition that currently affects over 12,000 people in Scotland. And we've, we've also heard that how over the next 20 years, the prevalence is forecast to increase rapidly. We recognize that demand um, for support is growing faster than our traditional services were designed for. So change is therefore essential. The principles of the integration of health and care support are central to this with a greater emphasis on joined up services for people that need to access them and a focus on anticipatory and preventative care. The integration of health and social care support is therefore one of the most significant reforms for public service in Scotland. It's about ensuring services are suitable and sustainable for the future, enabling those who use services to get the right support for them. And I think a number of members today made the point about how that has to be a personalised support um, for wh whatever their needs are and at any point in their care journey. Brian Whittle um, asked us to take a swing um, against neurological conditions as government um, and um, uh, we've made it a priority within our programme for government to improve access to care and support for people with neurological conditions to enable them to live well on their own terms. And over the past 18 months, we've worked hard um, in collaboration with the neurological community to develop Scotland's first national action plan on neurological conditions. As Kenneth Gibson said in his contribution, we're currently reviewing um, uh, uh, the responses to our consultation on the action plan and intend to publish that in final form later this year. The draft plan sets out some 17 commitments across integrated care and support services and these were informed by what people told us um, about their lives, life, life experiences and their priorities. And these very much echo the findings of Parkinson UK's report reassuring us that we are focusing on the right areas to make the difference that people want and that Scotland needs. A five-year plan aims to build um, a sustainable neurological workforce, improve the coordination of services and support, and realise equitable and timely access to ensure that people experience high standards of person-centred care at the right time. And I'll touch on some of these in turn. Workforce planning, which has been raised um, by a number of members, Kenneth Gibson um, has written to me on numerous occasions ab about this important matter, and it's one of the key areas, focuses of the action plan. We expect people with neurological conditions, such as Parkinson's, to have access to a range of care and support professionals to ensure appropriate management of their conditions, and that includes specialist nurses, um, as mentioned by Miles Briggs, Kenneth Gibson, Jackie Bailey, I think just about everyone who contributed mentioned the, the fantastic work of, of the specialist nurses and how, they, how important they are. And since 2015, we've invested some £2.4 million to enhance specialist nursing services and we'll be exploring delivery and workforce models to learn from what is working well. Our aim is to innovate and enhance existing services, ensuring that people can access the specialist services that they need. 
and we'll, we'll build on the progress um, that we've achieved to date over the past decade and the number of consultants with a, a neuro neurology speciality has increased by over 50 percent um, so but we need to continue that, that work and to make sure that we have got the correct support. We've also induced, introduced the, the real living wage for adult social care support workers. And in, in addition, uh, free personal care is now available to everyone um, assessed as requiring it, no matter what their age is. I'm looking at the time, so I'm going to move a bit forward. Um, as the motion rightly acknowledges, family and friends play an important role in supporting those with Parkinson's Without the dedication of unpaid carers, the system would struggle to cope. So that's one of the reasons why we introduced the Carers Act, which uh, came into effect last April. And the Act puts um, in place a, a system of carers' rights designed to listen to carers, improve consistency of support and prevent problems. It helps to sustain caring relationships and protect carers' health and well-being. The commitments in the National Action Plan, and I apologise that I haven't managed to, to cover them all, um, should um, embed the Carers Act and it should, the aim is for us to um, reduce the waiting times um, that, that people are having to experience. Part of that is the, the waiting times improvement plan where we've um, announced an additional £70 million investment recently um, uh, to target long waits with neuro neurology being one of the specialities that has, has benefit, benefited. Um, just to summarise, because I see I'm well over time, presiding officer, um, this has been a really important debate. There is a lot of really good work going on, and I can assure members across the chamber that um, we, we work regularly with Parkinson's UK Scotland as, as one of the key partners that, that we consult when we're making decisions around um, not just Parkinson's, but neurological conditions in, in general. Because as, as Brian Whittle indicated, there's a lot of, while these conditions might be very, very different, there are a lot of similarities in the, in the, the requirements and the support that we need to give. So again, thank uh, Miles Briggs for bringing the debate to the Chamber and for everyone for their contributions. Thank you. Thank you very much. That concludes the debate and I close this meeting.